Hello everybody, welcome back to session two of our mock anatomy test series. Today I'm gonna to be going through another 10 anatomy labeling questions. And this time I'm gonna go give you the image, ask you to label the structure, and then directly go into the explanation and the answer for that image. As opposed to my last session where I gave you all 10 images up front and then went through the answers afterwards. And I'd love to hear back from you whether you prefer it this way around or whether you'd prefer to get all the images first before going through explanations. So I'm gonna do five seconds per image, pause the uh, video if you need more time in an image, and then I'm gonna give you the answer straight away. So let's go into question one, where we ask to name the structure here. So what we have here is the transverse sinus. So we've got paired transverse sinuses going both to the left and the right, and they're coming from the confluence of the sinuses here. And now the confluence is, is basically a draining point for the superior sagittal sinus, our straight sinus, and an occipital sinus. Our transverse sinus will then drain blood away from the brain. Uh, it's within the dural folds here, coming along uh, towards the sigmoid sinus. Just before it becomes a sigmoid sinus, we'll get the superior petrosal sinus uh, joining the transverse sinus. The sigmoid sinus will then come down into the jugular bulb and into the internal jugular vein. Question two. So what we have here is our T1 spinous process. Now the reason I've chosen to include this image here is because people often get confused with the number of cervical vertebrae versus the cervical nerve roots. So we've got seven cervical vertebrae. This is the first one, the atlas, C1. And then we've got an, our, our dontoid or our dense of C2, our axis, C3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and then it turns into T1. Now our nerve roots, they start out as C1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, C8, and then T1. So uh, from our thoracic vertebra down, our uh, nerve roots are below the corresponding vertebra, whereas in the cervical region, our associated nerve root, our C1 nerve root is above our C1 vertebra, and so on. And then we've got that C8. So there's not eight cervical vertebra, but there are eight cervical nerve roots. Let's go on to question three. Here we ask to label this structure. Now what we have here is the sphenoid sinus. Now the sphenoid sinus is part of a group of four sinuses that are grouped under the umbrella term paranasal sinuses. So our sphenoid sinus is our most posterior sinus that we have here. And then in front of that sphenoid sinus, we've got our ethmoid sinuses. If we were to go now more inferiorly in this image below the orbits, we would have our maxillary sinuses. And then if we were go to if we were to scroll up higher in this image, more superior to where we are now, and more anterior, we have our frontal sinuses. So we've got four groups of paranasal sinuses. Here, the one we've asked to label is the sphenoid sinus. Let's go on to question four. Relatively simple labeling this bone. So what we have here is the cuboid bone. Now people, just like the carpals, often get muddled up with the tarsals. And what we want to know here is that the, the most lateral bone that articulates with the uh, fourth and the fifth metatarsal is the cuboid bone. And that lies laterally to our cuneiform. So that's just something to remember. People often label this the lateral cuneiform and in fact it's the cuboid bone. Question five, we have an axial slice through the brain here. What we have here is the right-sided head of chordate. So we have our lateral ventricles here and the chordate runs laterally to those lateral ventricles um, and it's bound laterally by the uh, anterior limb of the internal capsule. It's better seen here. And this is the posterior limb. And this is the head of our chordate. Now, as we go more superiorly and more posteriorly, the head of the chordate becomes the body and eventually down to the tail of the chordate. And some other structures that we can see that are also part of the basal ganglia here is our lentiform nucleus. And then we can also see other deep gray matter like our thalami here. Okay, question six. Uh, label this vessel or this structure. So here we have the left common carotid artery. And I've specifically chosen this image because there's no such thing as a carotid artery. You need to either say it's a common carotid artery or you need to say it's an internal external carotid artery. So it's very important that you put that this is the common carotid artery. And what we can see here in this arterial phase, phase, phase image is our left common carotid artery, which probably came straight off the arch of the aorta. 
And we can see on the right side, we've got our right sided subclavian as well as our right common carotid artery that both would have been branches off, not directly off of the aortic arch, but they would have come off the brachiocephalic trunk. So remember on the right side, it's the brachiocephalic trunk that then splits into the right subclavian and right common carotid, as opposed to the left side where we get the left common carotid coming directly off of the branch, off of the aorta, and then after that our left subclavian also coming directly off of the aortic arch. Let's go on to question seven, a relatively simple question here. We asked to label this structure, and this is the right medial rectus muscle. And uh, not to not get confused here, we've got right-sided and medial. So when you're looking at an image like this, you need to lateralize the muscle that you're naming, as well as knowing that this is the medial. It's a very easy mistake to either say left medial here or to say right lateral. Just make sure that you're getting your lateralization right in these images. Question number eight, asked to label this structure or this bone. And here we have the head of the um, ulna. Now, when you've got a lateral radiograph, you can't tell which bone is closest to you and which bone is furthest away. So what you need to know here, and we asked the label, maybe this arrow is not so great, but this is what we're labeling here. It's, uh, it's, it's necessary to know here in order to label this right, that the radius is much bigger towards the wrist and the ulna is much smaller there. And it's different when we get towards the elbow. The ulna is the larger bone there at the elbow with a small radial head. So this is the head of the ulna bone. Our penultimate question, question number nine, you asked to label the normal anatomical variant here. So what we have here is in this image is a, the, the type of image is a hysterosalpingogram. So we are putting a bulb here, this bulb, into the cervical canal and we're injecting dye and taking a radiograph to look at the endometrial cavity basically. And what we can see here is we've got either a bicornate uterus or a septate uterus. Now, the reason we can't tell whether it's bicornate or sept septate is we can't actually assess the myometrium here. We can only assess the cavity. And what we have here is two uterine cavities. So we've got one uterine cavity here on the left and one, oh, sorry, I've gone back an image. One uterine cavity on the left and one uterine cavity on the right here. Now, either this is a uterus that comes across like this and we've got endometrium coming down, forming a septum or we've got two separate uteri like this and uh, no myometrium here, well, then it'll be a bicornate uterus. Okay, going on to the last image, we asked to label this vessel. Take your time here if you need. And this is an extremely common question that you get asked in anatomy exams, and that's the branches of the celiac artery. So if we're looking at this image here, we've got the celiac trunk and we've got the superior mesenteric artery. And the celiac trunk, it branches in, in multiple different ways, but it kind of, three main arteries are coming off the celiac trunk. And sometimes one will come off earlier and one will come off later, but you get these three main arteries. The first being this left gastric artery, which will come into the lesser curvature of the stomach. Then to the left-hand side of the patient, we've got our splenic artery, which is a tortuous artery that will eventually end up in the spleen. And then we've got our common hepatic artery, and one of those branches of the common hepatic will actually give us our right-sided gastric artery, which will anastomose with this left gastric artery. And this is a very common question, so you really need to know the anatomy of the celiac trunk and its branches. Um, and it's a really important part of anatomy when it comes to assessing for lymph nodes and things like that further down the line. And this is some anatomy that we will cover more in future videos. So that's it. Those are the 10 questions. I hope they've helped. Um, I'd love your feedback as whether you like one question at a time or whether you want all the questions and me to go over it in the end. With that being said, I hope this has helped you. I hope your anatomy studying is going well and I'll see you all in the third session. Goodbye everyone.